Salt. This simple crystalline mineral has existed on Earth for billions of years, predating life itself. Occurring naturally in our oceans and underground deposits, salt has played a pivotal role in human civilization. In this documentary, we'll be exploring the history of this life-giving mineral. We'll also be traveling through Africa, Asia, Europe, and America to see how salt is mined and the many different types found in different regions throughout the world. This is the truest example of man's inseparable relationship with nature. It's the story of salt and earth, of salt and life. Deep within the vast and unforgiving desert of the Ethiopian Plateau lies the Danakil Depression. In terms of year-round average temperatures, it's the hottest place on the planet. As far as we know, the indigenous Afar people are the only human beings on Earth whose bodies are able to survive in such scorching temperatures. This is Mossa and his son. Tomorrow, they will be going on an important journey. It's late evening. Men arrive at a small camp carrying long wooden sticks. These sticks are normally used to drive camels. But for now, they are serving a different purpose. <laughs> From the hundreds of sticks at his feet, the elder will randomly select just a few dozen. If a man's stick is chosen, he will be tasked with a very important duty. They'll be going to a place the locals call the Gateway to Hell, a part of the desert that even the animals tend to steer clear of. But these men have no choice, for it's the only way they can make a living. The Dalal Volcano in the East African Great Rift Valley is not a normal volcano. In fact, it's one of the world's most bizarre. During eruptions, underground water from the Red Sea is brought to the surface, carrying massive amounts of salt deposits. When the water evaporates, it leaves behind a salt basin of 2,000 square kilometers. In ancient Africa, salt was just as valuable as gold, which is why people here refer to it as white gold. Before oil was discovered, 
Salt was most likely Africa's most precious economic resource. For these men, salt is their only source of survival, so it must be acquired at all costs. To carry out his work, Moss's son must first learn how to shape and polish his axe. Mosa has been trying to pass down his knowledge and experience of salt mining to his son, just as his father did for him. He hopes that one day his boy will follow in his footsteps. Although it's only early April, the temperature here is over 45 degrees Celsius. Masa has been taking his son into the desert on trips like this for years and has taught him everything he knows. The day will be his son's first big test. The salt marsh appears in the distance like a huge mirror and the sun reflects off its surface in shimmering arrows. The light is so intense, so staring directly at it could blind you. There are just two tribes of indigenous people who have lived in these inhospitable lands, the Afars and the Tigrayans. The latter live in the fertile Ethiopian plateau and possesses plenty of camels and grassland. While the Afars live further out in the desert, closer to the salt resources. The two tribes have a tacit agreement. The Afars will mine the salt and the Tigrayans will transport it. After a two-hour trek through the desert, they finally arrive at their destination. The mosses and other tribesmen, selected from the previous night's draw, have formed a team. First, they'll need to use their axes to crack open the dried earth. Once the big chunks have been removed, they're smashed and shaved into even smaller pieces. There's a certain skill in breaking down these brittle salt lumps into regular sized pieces. If the pieces are too small, they will greatly decrease in value. Any salt lost from the chopping process will eventually solidify in the crusted earth. These are the Tigrayan people. They are wandering the desert with their camels in search for long-term trading partners. Normally, they will pay the mosses around 10 cents for each chunk of salt. They're heading to the Ethiopian plateau, where they'll sell the salt at nearly 10 times that price. Oh, 
The day has been a good haul for the mosses. The money they earn from today's work will pay their living expenses for the next two months. On the way back, both men seem to have a new spring in their step, and the day's fatigue is almost forgotten. For Masa, it was the day his son became a man, and for his son, it was the day he learned what it takes to make a living. For people living in the Danakil Depression, these salt deposits are their lifeblood. As long as the volcano eruptions continue, salt will continue to support these humble tribes for generations to come. In Zhuagong, in the southwestern part of China, something special is about to happen. This towering pine wood structure is called a crown block. It's 118 meters high, about as tall as a 39-story building. In China, it's been called the Eiffel Tower of the East. This crown block has an important fixture in China's salt well production from the very beginning. In the past, Zhuogong was known as the salt capital of southwest China and possessed tens of thousands of salt wells, each equipped with its own crown block. Processes such as well drilling, well maintenance, and brine lifting all required one of these now primitive looking structures. Brine from thousands of meters below the surface can be extracted through its tiny wellhead. It's truly an exceptional piece of ancient technology. The brine extracted by the crown block is piped to a nearby kitchen where dozens of vats are in operation day and night, boiling the black brine into sparkling white salt. This salt unlike refined salt produced through industrial processes, is used for making pickles that are crunchy with a less salty taste. Today, only a few crown blocks remain in Suogong and are only capable of producing a small amount of well salt. Roller workers are the men specialized in the general upkeep of these crown blocks. Because of hundreds of years of exposure to the elements, they require annual inspections and maintenance to remain productive. Today, 
Long Shueten, a 52-year-old roller worker, is leading his team to the highest crown block in the city. A few weeks ago, one of the team members had three of his fingers cut off while working. Since only a few people are trained to do the job, the men have found themselves short-staffed. In order to get the job done, 52-year-old Long Shua Tian will have to do it himself. The wooden crown block is over 100 meters high. In the past, roller workers would have to climb the towering structures and change their steel wires without any safety equipment. It goes without saying, it's not a job for those who are scared of heights. With minimal protection, fear can cause lapses in judgment. So confidence and courage are key. To make matters worse, Long Shui Tian has estimated that about 100 steel wires and numerous wooden wedges will need to be replaced. The most important thing is to stay calm and steady, for one wrong move can lead to certain death. Changing the steel wires that hold the apparatus together generally requires at least two skilled roller workers. As it happens, both of these men are over 40 years old, so having to work in the heat of summer makes their job that much more dangerous. Unfortunately, they're the only ones who can do it. Roller workers must rely on teamwork. Once they are on the crown block, each man must perform their duty flawlessly as their partner's life literally hangs in the balance. And if the weather changes, things can go from bad to worse in a heartbeat. After an hour of grueling work, Long Shua Tian and his partner descend the crown block for a much needed rest. His plan is to retire in two years. However, he has no idea who will be able to fill his shoes when he's gone. These men are the last guardians of an ancient salt industry that goes back hundreds of years. They know that one day these crown blocks will be taken down. So every time they climb one, they wonder if it will be their last. For them, performing their duty is more of a ritual than a job. It's also part of their identity. So losing these historical structures will be like losing part of themselves.
Salzburg in Western Austria is the oldest city in the country. This tourist attraction is more than just a mere slide. It's part of Austria's history. In the past, this slide was just a convenient means to get to the lower levels of the mine. Miners spent days on end here, eating, sleeping, and praying, underground and in the dark. But unlike the mines of today, they weren't mining for coal, iron, or gold. They were looking for salt. Early in the 17th century, visiting these salt mines was a novelty for the upper class in Salzburg. Clutching each other tightly, they'd ride the steep wooden tracks like bobsledders, reaching depths of 40 meters at roller coaster speeds. This is the famous Durenberg salt mine. Unlike lake, sea, pond, or well salt, the salt here is buried deep within the earth in the form of solid ore. Because they look like rocks, it's most commonly referred to as rock salt. The tunnels are divided into four levels each about 40 meters apart. Yet if this mine wasn't living proof, no one would have believed such an undertaking would have been possible. In 1846, mummified remains were found in this very salt mine. Archaeologists could tell from their tools they were miners from the pre-700s. As of today, no one knows how they were killed or buried at such a depth. But the ongoing theory is that it was the quantity of salt in the earth that kept them in such good condition. In recent years, Holger Wendling and fellow archaeologists have excavated nearly 400 tombs of celts in and around the Durenberg salt mine. Inside are the bodily remains of ancient Celts, along with their tools, clothing, food, and even excrement. Experts have surmised that their mining efforts began during the Iron Age, or perhaps the earlier Stone Age. What we know is that uh, around 600, 500 BC, the first major look for or search for salt was going on here. Salt was, of course, one of the major things to own and uh, to have control over salt mining meant that you could acquire just amazingly uh, a big proportion of, uh, of wealth in the end. Among their findings were some exquisite amber deposits, which appeared to have been imported from either the Baltic coast or some northern European cities. At that time, salt was the most basic commodity used to trade for other goods. Nowadays, we would rather think um, that there is rather some kind of, not an equal society, but that uh, far more people, and also the rich people, were digging up the salt in the mines. So uh, it was not like the big bosses sitting outside the mines and acquiring the wealth by trading. Sternberg Mountain is now proven to be the oldest underground mine in Europe. The springs beneath the surface contain brine, which can be boiled and crystallized into salt, while the lush forests above provide the energy required for evaporating the brine. Salzburg is located at the foot of the Alps, and the Salt River traverses the city 
which has made it an important channel for transporting salt for centuries. It became the region's most lucrative commodity, from the Danube to the Adriatic Sea, between Italy and the Balkan Peninsula. Archaeologists surmise it was here where the first salt mining efforts of the Iron Age began. In Tibet's Lantung River Valley, 2,300 meters above sea level, there are some curious structures built up against the mountain slopes. From afar, they almost look like rows of tiny dwellings, but they're actually man-made trestles used for producing salt. Due to the lack of sufficient lowlands and pastures, the trestles are propped up on wooden stilts. These are the Mong Kong salt fields of Tibet, and they have supported life here for more than 1,200 years. There are more than 3,000 salt fields and 50 salt springs along the Lantung River, stretching a distance of 1,500 meters. Traditionally, the women would transport the brine from the wells to the fields in large baskets they carried on their back. This is 36-year-old Shring Yi Chen. She is about to carry out the first step in salt processing, extracting the brine from the salt well. Luckily, today there's a much more efficient pumping system in place. Each family has their own small reservoir in the fields. Brine extracted from underground will be sun-dried until saturated and then poured into the salt fields. The Mong Kong salt fields produce the most colorful salt in the world, ranging from white to a pinkish color. The specific properties of the salt depend on its purity. Yi Chen is the only woman in her family who works in the salt fields. For her, April is the busiest because it's the only month of the year when she's able to make a pink salt called peach blossom. This kind of salt is considered to be the highest in quality. A popular drink here is buttered tea, made by blending fresh milk and butter, boiling it with tea, and adding a little pinch of peach blossom salt for that extra bit of taste.
According to Hmong Kong tradition, women do all the work in the salt fields, while the men are in charge of selling the dried salt. For more than 1,000 years, caravans carried salt to high altitude areas along the Tea Horse Road from Yunnan Province to Tibet. Hong Kong salt has long been popular with herdsmen because of their belief that it helps their horses and cattle grow and reproduce. In return, the Hong Kong people will trade for food that's scarce in their villages like highland barley and beef. Over the last 1,200 years, the production and trade of salt has allowed them to survive on an otherwise barren land. In April, unexpected rainfall ravages the salt fields. The continuous rain washes away many of the plots, and Yi Chen is forced into damage control. Repairing the fields requires hours of arduous manual labor. It's backbreaking work. In situations like this, it's customary for villagers to help one another. Even though Yi Chen is helping to repair her neighbor's salt patch, she does it for free and without complaint. While her sister-in-law has gone to collect herbs in the mountains, Yi Chen has agreed to look after her daughter. Even though these women have been working for eight hours straight without taking a break, they still seem to be in good spirits. <laughs> All the materials needed to build the salt fields are procured from the mountain. The support stilts are made from 30-year-old pine trees, and the rocks and sand are taken from the surrounding area. <laughs> the brine has been diluted by the rain, making it impossible to make peach blossom salt. However, there is still time to salvage the harvest if everyone works together. After five days of rain, the sun finally makes an appearance. Thanks to some much needed sunshine and a light breeze funneling through the valley, Yi Chen's salt fields are starting to rebound. Water is evaporating fast and soaking into the fields, and the hollow salt pillars are beginning to appear under the wooden shelves. Soon, pink flower-like crystals begin to form on the surface, indicating that the precious peach blossom salt is ready to harvest.
Hong Kong is among the few places in the world where salt is still produced by hand. Rather than the types of salt made by machines, Yi Chen's is pure artwork. The climate of the Lantung River and the surrounding mountains have bestowed Mong Kong with the unique resources to provide a salt that can't be found anywhere else in the world. In the small town of Varel in northern Germany, there's a small family museum that has preserved some of the secrets of early salt production. These pottery pieces are of special significance. Wendelin Leidinger was a pharmacist and amateur archaeologist. In 1963, he unearthed a large hall of broken pottery at a construction site in town. He calculated that they must have been buried for at least 3,000 years. Although no one at the time knew what they were used for, his intuition told him that they could have been instrumental to the history of salt making in Germany, or even the whole of Europe. Unable to shake his curiosity, he spent the rest of his life trying to uncover their mysteries. Ja, das hier ist jetzt die Adelsstandserhebungsurkunde von 1708. Nur hier ist das kaiserliche Siegel drin enthalten. Und hier ist der Text, dass die Erbselzer von gutem altem Stamme sind und eine Wappenbeschreibung. Hier in diesem Fall der Familie von Celion, genannt Brandis. Da ist hier das Wappen. While these records prove that the salt industry brought Varro great wealth in the 17th century, no other information about the city is provided. The woman standing beside Leidinger in many of his old photos is his wife, who's still alive today. Ich, äh, als ich zum ersten Mal 1965 die Ausgrabung gesehen habe, wo dieses Fürstengrab äh, gewesen ist, was ich, da war ich so fasziniert. Äh, wie kann das äh, 800, 900 Jahre in der Erde sein und man, man findet diese ganzen Sachen? Ich fand das so toll. Das ist ja so Mittelalter, ne? Ja. In the beginning, his wife worked as an assistant at his pharmacy and later joined him in his archaeological research. Für meinen Mann auch. Wir waren uns da ganz einig. Und dann, als dann diese Salzgeschichte mit den Briketagen anfing, das war so faszinierend. Die Leute, also was, was sucht ihr für alle Lehmklumpen da aus der Erde? Was ist das für ein Quatsch? Und wenn man doch bedenkt, dass diese Leute mit diesen Briketagen diese Öfen gebaut haben, um diese Salzkuchen zu machen, das ist so eine faszinierende Geschichte, ähm, äh, dass, dass die das schon so in, im Kopf hatten, so etwas zu machen. Das musste doch alles probiert werden. Ne? Mhm. 
The long and privately funded archaeological mission lasted more than four decades. His wife recalls her husband waking up at 5.30 a.m. every day, riding his bicycle for miles to the town's construction sites before opening his pharmacy at 8 a.m. Leidinger believed that these pottery pieces could be used to reconstruct a long-lost history. One time, he recovered a set of pots and their holders, which he was convinced were used to produce salt. The Leidinger's efforts, along with the city's last remaining salt-making relics, have revived the 3,000-year-old process of making salt in clay pots. When Leidinger passed away in 2010, he donated his house along with his extensive collection to the city. Now his findings will be preserved in this remote town in northern Germany forever. Das Museum ist nach wie vor auch immer noch meine zweite Heimat. Am liebsten gehe ich in Werl zum Mutter Gottes in die Kirche, an zweiter Stelle in das Museum. From time to time, Leidinger's wife will visit the cemetery where he was buried and reflect on the still vivid memories of the amazing life they shared together. This place is about 300 kilometers from Xining, capital of Qinghai province. Here, lying conspicuously in the valley of a mountainous desert, is Chaka Salt Lake. Its waters are so clear that it's sometimes referred to as the mirror of the sky. In the evenings, one can even see the Milky Way amongst the starry landscape. The simple train that runs alongside the lake was once used to transport salt. Mr. Jan and his workmates have been mining salt here since the 1970s. After breaking the thick layer of brine just below the water's surface, massive quantities of lake salt can be extracted using nothing more than a shovel. <laughs> This is one of the most basic forms of salt mining. Chaka Lake is one of the largest salt reserves in the world and is said to have enough to feed China's entire population for the next 70 years. Today, the old train is mainly used for transporting workers and tourists. There's such an excess of salt here that they're even allowed to take home a few souvenirs. Oh, 
Although Mr. Jan is retired now, he still finds time to dig up some salt flowers for tourists. Jan has worked here for almost half his life. In the past, he and his team would transport the salt by hand and train, but now it's taken by a ship steered by his own son. It gives him all the more reason to believe that the future of salt mining here is promising. Yet another even larger salt reserve lies just to the west. At 100 miles wide and 25 miles long, Cha Erhan Salt Lake is the largest potash fertilizer production base in China. At current consumption, the lake will be able to provide salt for the next 1,000 years. But the salt contained in the Chaka and Charhan lakes is merely a handful compared with the planet's total reserves, proving that while the world may have a super abundance of water, the same is true of salt. But just as history has shown us, there was no limit to human ingenuity. Whether it be high, low, far or wide, we'll use every tool at our disposal to find it, even if it costs us our own blood, sweat and tears. The sodium we get from salt is fundamental for human survival. It's as important as the water we drink, the air we breathe, and the flora and fauna we eat. It is truly one of Mother Nature's most noble and bounteous gifts. <laughs>